So what a wild week it's been so far. Um, let's do this a little bit differently. Uh, is there any questions that anyone wants to get to immediately? Maybe they're a little uh, confused about uh, something um, <clears throat> or they uh, have some other uh, questions or concerns. Um, let's try to start off there. And then if uh, nothing presents itself, we'll just continue on with looking at the events that happened this week. Just, just a quick one, if I may. Um, I just want to know, is there a wiki out about installing Ronan Dojo on a Linux system, like just on a normal Linux laptop, the way I would any other node instead of on a Raspberry Pi? If there is, it would really help me. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think um, the Ronan Dojo package will work on like X, uh, x86 systems yet. Uh, so it only works on uh, AMD 64, I believe. Um, there's wiki though for uh, Ronan Dojo. I think it's uh, wiki dot uh, Ronan Dojo dot io or something like that. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I've got that one. I'll, I'll just I'll just throw in Raspberry Pi. It's cool. Thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, we do have, uh, of course, uh, documentation for regular vanilla Dojo putting that onto a normal, you know, uh, Linux system. But if you want specifically Ronan Dojo, I'm not 100 percent sure you could do that quite yet. Sorry, just to repeat that, it's called what system? The, the one that can go on Linux? Uh, just just normal Dojo that uh, normal Samurai Dojo. Wallet produces, yeah. Ah, uh, I think that's where I got to miss up. Thanks so much. Okay, I'm ready for the rest of this stuff. <laughs> okay, no problem. Uh, so, yeah, I guess the, the big news uh, this week uh, is, well, it, it kind of all started initially, actually, with with this kind of cryptic um, tweet from the Wasabi Wallet uh, Twitter account mentioning that ZK Snacks, which is the company behind Wasabi Wallet and that runs the coordinator, uh, will start refusing certain UTXOs from registering to coin joints. Uh, this was obviously quite a, a shocking statement that I, I don't think many people were prepared for. Uh, and they didn't give much in the way of clarity uh, throughout the thread. Uh, besides, you know, Nopara, who's the founder of Wasabi, posting an F. And if you don't know, the F signifies uh, pay res uh, press F to pay respects, as in the thing is dead or dying. So you pay your respects by pressing F. It's an old meme. Um, so there's real, really no clarification. And people were left to wonder, like, what the hell is going on? So this is March 13th. Um, yesterday, March 15th, an article came out in the Financial Times. Um, and the general gist of the article is that crypto mixers, quote unquote, the term that they use, um, are being used to launder money, blah, blah, blah. We've all heard this before. Uh, the FCA is the UK's serious crime uh, uh, watchdog or regulator. And they say that, you know, coin join or mixing needs to be regulated in the same way that um, <clears throat> like exchanges are regulated. So that's, that's, that's all that was really said about it, in, at least in the FCA. So it wasn't that there's a new regulation coming. It wasn't that, um, you know, they're going to they're start cracking down on this. It was a desire for for these services and the these, these software to be regulated. Uh, so a lot of people are wondering is, is, you know, this article, what kind of pushed Wasabi over the edge to implement what amounts to censorship of UTXOs, blacklists. Um, you know, they haven't released any information as to which law they, they might be um, having to comply with or which regulation they might be having to comply with. Um, all that they've said is they, they, there's something that they have to comply with, um, but no clarity has been given. So if it is indeed the NCA's uh, claim or, you know, desire for um, regulation to be to be implemented it's uh, you know it seems like they're jumping the gun um 
now we can, you know, we have some insight because we received a, a letter from the Financial Times on March 11th, um, where we got a heads up that, you know, the National Crime Agency is, is warning about crypto mixers. You can see the email they sent us right on my screen here. Um, and, you know, there's eight bullet points here of questions, I guess, or statements that the reporter is is putting to us and they asked for a response. Um, if you haven't read the the response, I, I urge you to. Uh, we sent a what I think is a um, well explained and and good faith uh, response to the reporter at the Financial Times. Of course, she only used um, one sentence from the response, and that's why we published it in full so people could read it themselves. Um, but I'm not going to go through it verbatim over here. So you can see there's a, there's a lot of text there. Uh, but essentially, we, re we respond to these eight points. Um, and we expect that Wasabi also received uh, an email probably identical to, to this one that you're receiving, uh, that you're reading right now on my screen. Um, our position is the same position that it's, you know, that it's always been is that we're not interested in building tools that enhance um, detriment to users. So we would never, we would never do anything like implementing blacklists. We would rather, we would rather shut down entire operation than do something like that. Um, what we're mostly confused about in uh, the realm of the, the Wasabi situation is why? why? Why did they choose to implement blacklists into their, um, their software when there doesn't appear to be any law or regulation that would require them to do so? Uh, the only thing they may, you could argue, is that one regulatory agency in the UK is making some noise saying they, they, they think that there should be regulation on this. Um, so then the second big piece of information came out from the Wasabi team uh, from their Telegram group. And this is Nopara73, who's the founder of Wasabi Wallet, mentioning in his group that they're going to have to hire a blockchain analysis company and filter out coin joint input registrations with them. So it's not only blacklist, but it's also uh, a front end for chain analysis, chain surveillance in in the coin join, at the front end of the coin join. Um, from when and exactly what kinds of inputs should be the victims of this censorship is unclear at this point. So, you know, it sounds like they don't have regulatory clarity. Um, it sounds, you know, if there was a regulatory uh, issue that they needed to comply with, it would be clear. It would be very clear what they what they're supposed to do. Um, so this, I mean, uh, I, I, I've come to expect a lot of things from Wasabi, uh, the, even, you know, even the blacklist didn't really surprise me. They've had a terms of service from the very beginning. And the term of service said that you're not allowed to, to use Wasabi if you're, you know, uh, doing any illegal activity or sex work or using, uh, buying fireworks or, you know, all sorts of crazy shit. So the fact that they finally decided to enforce their terms of service didn't surprise me. But this is really surprising. Um, for a CoinJoin uh, privacy wallet to partner with chain surveillance companies that have been done nothing but damage Bitcoin privacy and Bitcoin's fungibility, uh, to partner with them and put them as a front end to your, your CoinJoin implementation is, is shocking actually. Uh, so I, I mean, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, we'll, we'll find out more information. Maybe, um, it will come out, but before, um, I open up the, the floor to questions, you know, I, I've made it kind of clear that we're, we don't see any regulatory environment where, um, where non-custodial software developers would have to implement this type of black one blacklist and two, um, partnership with chain analysis or chain surveillance firms. Uh, you know, the, 
Wasabi Wallet is based in the EU, which is, you know, a, I don't know why they decided to to do that when they created the company, but they did. Uh, and the the predominant regulatory um, regime in the EU and in the UK is the anti-money laundering fifth directive or directive five. So if we're just going to look at that for a second, because the AML um, directive five has very, very specific um, language that it uses and who falls into being regulated by this particular regulation is, is very clear. Uh, and the two, two points I want to bring out are virtual currency exchange platforms. So these are providers engaged in exchange services between virtual currencies and fiat currencies. And custodian wallet providers, providers of custodian wallets or crypto wallet services where they hold the user's private keys to hold, store, and transfer virtual currencies. These are the two main points to, to think about when you're asking, when you're, when you're thinking about whether Wasabi, uh, Z, uh, the coordinator or the wallet developers would fall into these two categories. Well, they clearly wouldn't fall into a virtual currency exchange platform because they don't deal with um, the exchange of a BTC to fiat. And they don't, as far as we understand, uh, provide custodial wallet. Uh, it'd be very surprising if they did. So they wouldn't fall into the custodian wallet providers um, portion of this uh, regulation. But what, you know, what do they have to do if they did follow fall into this? Well, they would have to besides register their business with uh, local authorities, which they've already done. Uh, they would be subject to AML requirements. Um, they would be considered financial institutions. They would be required to implement KYC and due diligence and do suspicious activity reporting and hand over identifiable uh, user information to what are called financial intelligence units. Um, they're doing this. This is what they're talking about doing, suspicious activity reporting and customer due diligence. They're doing this without having a regulatory need to do so. Uh, and that can be verified by reviewing the fifth money laundering directive that the EU, uh, that's enforced in the EU and various other countries outside the EU, like the UK. Um, <clears throat> so our, our position is there is no regulation, whether it be EU or US, um, or Canadian, uh, that would require a non-custodial wallet developer or a non-custodial service provider to comply with any, uh, with any rule to that, uh, that states they need to do sus uh, suspicious activity reporting, need to do blacklisting, um, needs to, t uh, collect KYC information, needs to, um, partner up with a chain surveillance firm. There's no, it doesn't exist. Uh, and I, I, I think it's, it's very strange that they're being, they're being so vague about what's caused their decision to do this. I truly believe that they got spooked when the financial times sent them an article saying that the national crime agency wants a regulation and the response has been shameful. So that's all I have um, on that situation. And I'd like to open the floor up to, to any questions. I'm actually curious. I think, I mean, maybe it's not as much of a question, but maybe it's not related to the actual, you know, 5 AMLD in this case. Maybe they've been hit up by some uh, law enforcement agency because of sure. the different X coins and maybe they've just, you know, outside of this normal regulation have been said, you know, they've said, well, you need to partner with us or it's over for you. Otherwise it could, I mean, I'm just speculating, right. But it, maybe it could be that it's kind of just an external requirement that's just being pushed onto them. Yeah. I, I, I thought about that as well, Stefan. Uh, so, you know, there, 
there's two kind of, so there's two jurisdictions right now that um, Wasabi and ZK Snacks have a, a tie with, right? So the, the, the corporate entity itself, uh, ZK Snacks, is in Gibraltar. Um, and the, uh, I believe their offices and employees are in Hungary. Uh, so let's say they, they receive a request uh, from law enforcement in the U.S. Well, the, the, um, they have no real obligation to comply with a U.S. Uh, law enforcement request, right? Uh, even a court order, they could just tell them to go buzz off and then they decide they'll never go to the U.S. Um, but even, so, so it's unlikely that that's what it is. It, it could be a Hungarian police order or a court order. It could be a Gibraltar court order. Uh, to to supply information, right? That's what the court order would be about. It's like, hey, you have information. We, we know that the this hacker went into Wasabi, so give over all your information about, you know, these inputs. Um, I don't believe that's what happened because if that was what happened, I, I Wasabi would be able to have a feather in its cap and say, we, you know, be very open with the community and say, look, the court came to us and said to give all their information, and this is exactly what we gave them, nothing, because we can't. We have no information on the users, and that's that's how this was designed. Um, that's the, ex the response I would have expected from a, a uh, court order uh, to comply. Now, you know, then the argument, oh, maybe there's a gag order. Uh, you know, those those gag orders aren't really used outside the U.S. very frequently. Uh, they're, they're quite uncommon in, in the EU. Um, so I, I don't believe that to be the case. So while it is, it, it is feasible what you described, Stefan, uh, I, I, I doubt that's what, it, that's what it's about. Uh, because why wouldn't you be proud to, to, to tell your user base with a feather in your cap and say, yes, we got requested information, but we were not able to provide them anything useful. Right, that would be similar to how, let's say, when Signal gets requested and they say, look, we don't have the info, so we don't have your message data, et cetera, right? Um, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's a good answer. Um, I, I wonder then, is it that they are, I'm just, I, I think I'm just very confused because looking at the public statements from the Wasabi wallet and the ZK Snacks uh, team, it just seems very unusual that they're trying to, have this weird in-between position of saying we are a privacy wallet, but we're actually going to start, you know, blocking certain coins or certain uh, doing certain analysis. And it just, I don't know. I'm just confused by the whole thing. And maybe there's more uh, clarity that'll be coming out later. But it just, it just seems extremely uh, damaging to the overall reputation of the, of the company and the and of uh, the the project. It's totally confusing, uh, and I, I think you know. I think there's there must be confusion over at the Wasabi uh, HQ because you know this was what was posted just a mere couple. I think it was four hours before the declaration that you know you won't be able to coin join them all actually. So uh, keep calm and coin join them all, and then suddenly, you know, <laughs> the coordinator refused certain UTXOs, uh, and then you know. Um, someone asks, well, any information, I do mute this account, so please excuse that. Someone asks, are you teaming up with chain analysis and reporting suspicious UTXOs? And this, this individual who works for Wasabi and, you know, stated unequivocally, no, we're not going to do that. But then suddenly the next day, no para in the Wasabi wallet telegram group says, yeah, we're going to have to hire a, um, an analysis company. You know, so I don't think the left hand knows what the right hand's doing really over in Wasabi. And I think that they're, it's in their interest right now to play silent and dumb. Uh, because if, if the truth is that they've implemented this as a result of a Financial Times article, it's, it's really embarrassing and it's really silly. Great. Anyone else? Uh, I saw there were some comments in text, so let me try to read that. Uh, 
So crypto and TISAs, I think Samurai Wallet just hit the nail on the head. They've done exactly what Bull, uh, Bull Bitcoin did in Canada and invited this in. Basically, yeah, that's preemptive self-regulation. Uh, and, I, you know, maybe it's as simple as the, um, the two CEOs who, who run Wasabi Wallet, they have two CEOs, I don't quite understand why, uh, are both uh, EU Commission alumni. They both have long experience as uh, lawyers and politicians or, or experts within the EU Commission. Um, they obviously have no no issue with regulation itself, and they may see a niche um, a niche area where compliant coin joins are desired by uh, you know a portion of the market. I think that's that's insane. Um, an insane thought, but that might be where their heads at. It doesn't. It doesn't seem like the contributors to Wasabi are, are thrilled with this development. You know, uh, how how could you be? Um, so it could have been a decision from you know from the top, um, but it's still you know it's still there. That's the decision, and and users and we all have to deal with it now. I suppose, given the um, uh, previous public statements uh, from the co-founders, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that this is actually a play um, to get a regulatory capture here. So um, given that they have been historically um, getting a, a degree of liquidity within the market for coin joins, um, and they've already got like a network effect there, I suppose it could be a, a potential play uh, for them to um, kind of circle the wagons, um, make it expensive for any other um, coordinator to set up um, because of the obligation of, um, of, of paying for chain analysis if they make that a regulatory requirement and doing that to kind of cement their position. Um, I suppose that's, that's a potential kind of way that the founders could have looked at it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that's a, that's a possibility. I, I don't know just dealing with wasabi in the past i don't know if they're that strategic uh, maybe they are and um maybe it's it's a grand play but that's a you know that's a typical playbook thing to do um i don't you know i don't see how how compliant coin join uh if there's an alternative in the market in the form of samurai wallet and join market and you know various other things that are going to pop up i'm sure um how they'll they'll be able to compete effectively um but yes what it does do is it gives regulators a a um like a, a hand ledge to to grasp onto right so the next time the the for the sixth money laundering directive you know they have an example of of a compliant coin join how how it can work a case study uh, of how it can work and how it, it, it's receiving liquidity and it solves the, the um, quote unquote, solves the privacy problem that you just face when using a transparent blockchain, but while remaining compliant with money laundering regulations. And, um, you know, if, if they go through with this and it's successful and people use it, it will be, it will definitely be seen as a case study uh, for regulatory bodies and will will be recommended as the way to do things properly uh, so so what should have happened right as soon as well like what, what we did when, when we got the email from the financial times is is a very very clear foot down saying no um non-custodial software is not subject to regulations it, it you know it never has been and what you're proposing is is way out of line so that opposition has been from from the main industry participants opposition has been registered uh and it's on the record uh, instead you have compliance immediate compliance uh that sends the wrong the wrong messages it's kind of a mirror of what happened with the aopp but much much more serious How about uh, any other questions?
feel free to to talk, guys. Unless you're auto muted, I don't think I auto muted every anyone. So I think uh, feel free to jump uh, in and ask questions. Samurai, I just wanted to say thanks a lot. I'm busy installing that my dojo right now on my Linux computer. So oh, cool. <laughs> All right. Good luck. So one of, I guess, one of the things I can I can talk about. Um, so when they were debating the uh, the fifth money laundering directive, it hadn't it hadn't gone into effect yet. They were still discussing it, and and you know this is I mean this is how regulatory bodies work. You know you you don't usually get a a surprise letter in the in the in the mail one day from a regulator saying, hey, here's a new regulation and you're in violation. Uh, there's comment period, there's proposals, especially in the EU, there's countless committees that are formed and, and people talk about it and comments are, are, are gathered. Uh, and that's, that's how the fifth money laundering directive, uh, you know, started out. And one of the provisions was, um, that, oh, let me, let me jump back over here. Um, so one of the provisions in the early draft was that custodian wallet providers, it was custodian and non-custodian. So it would have affected Samurai and it would have affected uh, all, all non-custodial wallets operating in the EU and, and the UK. Um, so we identify, we, we keep a very, very close eye on the regulatory landscape of, of, all, of, of all the main major countries. Um, and we identified that as a serious threat a uh, potential threat to the ongoing longevity of, of Samurai and what we can do. Um, even though it ended up not becoming part of the regulation, they, it was removed, the non-custodial wallet providers, we had already made a decision that we needed to move jurisdictions. Our, our, our development was, was occurring in the UK at that time. Uh, and as soon as we saw that, we, we began the process of Delinking ourselves from the UK, making sure that no uh, no developers were there, um, no uh, you know no servers existed there, nothing uh, nothing nothing uh, to tie us to the UK, uh, and and we got the hell out, and that's what's known as a jurisdictional arbitrage. You know you don't you you don't have to necessarily leave the country itself. You can you, you your corporate entity gets relocated in the in the case of. Wasabi, for example, if if there was an issue uh, in Gibraltar or the EU, they theoretically could set up a company somewhere else and not operate out of that country anymore, and without breaking any laws whatsoever. Um, so you, you know, just like uh, wealthy individuals, they they move their country, um, move their citizenship. Um, for a, a better tax advantage, uh, companies and, and entities can do the same thing. So it's, it's an example of one of the strategies that you can employ to, to um, get around these types of issues when reg regulations do change in your area. Uh, of course, the other option uh, is to not comply and to stop, um, you know, stop doing whatever it is that you're not allowed to be doing anymore. Um, and, you know, I think that there's an, that's an honorable decision to make if, if you have no other options left. Um, I don't believe that was the case in Wasabi's, uh, in this particular case. I think that there's plenty of options left. I don't even think there's a, a regulation that they're um, needing to follow. But if, if it did get to that point, if regulations change, if something changed, the honorable thing to do is to say, look, we're, we're not going to, um, we're not going to validate this. We're not going to. Do, do something that's detrimental to Bitcoin users and Bitcoin privacy and, and Bitcoin fungibility. So we'd rather not do it. Jumped on this a little bit late, but uh, if, uh, <laughs> sorry, dri driving as well, listening to you guys. But um, question for you, as far as the actual mechanism of identifying, I guess, quote unquote, blacklisted GTXOs, do we know what that is yet? Because from what I've seen, I it just seems like this vague. We're identifying blacklisted UTXOs and uh, and throwing those into a pool and saying no. Um, is that something that 
like we know how they're doing that or i mean like because if if samurai was like somehow compelled to do that you guys are you stopping because of ability or are you stopping because you're saying hell no and choosing to stop so so the first part of your question um well one everything about this whole thing is vague you know they haven't they haven't been exactly forthright uh or, or direct or clear um with how they uh, intend to to blacklist uh what we do know that came out earlier uh, late yesterday is that they're going to hire a blockchain surveillance company so either you know chain analysis or, or um uh what's what's the um the elliptic, my, elliptic uh, there's another one um petrov runs i forgot the one that petrov runs but anyway they one of the surveillance firms to to they're going to outsource the surveillance firm to flag anything that would uh, be a problem, uh, so to speak. So it's it's exactly what the exchanges do and any of the uh, custodial third party applications or services do. Um, as for whether we can't or, or uh, physically can't, uh, the it, yes, we could physically put a blacklist and say, no UTXOs of this are allowed to enter. It's just, it, it, you know, one, it's, it's so trivial to get around. Um, and two, once something's confirmed, it's confirmed, right? So if, you know, uh, if that blacklist search doesn't trigger something uh, and the, the UTXO gets confirmed, there's nothing we can do about it at that point. Um, but any centralized coordinator uh, has the ability to, you know, filter or do anything like that. So it would really be a, we're not going to do that. And we're either not going to do it by moving jurisdictions. If there is a regulation that says we have to do it, or if that's not feasible, um, we won't offer the service. We won't do it anymore because it's not right. Uh, I don't know who asked that question, but thank you for the question, whoever you were. I, I did, thanks. Anyone else out there? We have uh, quite a few people listening in now. I have a question. I want to ask uh, something that's been coming out of from the Wasabi uh, community. Um, okay. Some mentioned where they were talking about they're going to fork the the project and and they're going to be running um, uh, anonymous coordinators. And to me, it doesn't seem like it's going to be make sense. Even though they were even suggesting that uh, they will add on uh, the Wasabi coordinator into uh, Umbro, and people can run their own coordinators. Can you explain right. that in detail why that doesn't make sense? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so before we jump on to people running their own coordinators on their umbra, um, let's take a step back to the the. Uh, I think they're they're calling it Wasabi BTC or something like that. Um, so this is a group of NIMS, I suppose, who have decided that they they're going to um, fork the. A Wasabi coordinator, which is open source, so they, they can do that. And they're going to offer coordination uh, without these blacklists. Um, I believe that's a accurate representation of what the, these people plan on doing. And, I, and it, it, it's a good thing um, that the response is for uh, that to happen. That's, that's something you, you want to see, right? Uh, there are challenges ahead if they intend to do that. Um, the biggest challenge that they're going to have is drawing liquidity um, to their coordinator, right? So it's it's quite difficult to bootstrap a coordinator. You need to get people on board, and the more people you have on board using your coordinator, the more resilient and the, the larger the uh, the base anonymity set is. Um, so the challenge for them is going to be to attract liquidity. Um, the secondary challenge for them is going to be 
to, um, well, obviously fix the, the bugs and the issues that are present in the Wasabi coordinator. And our, our, I mean, my biggest uh, hope is that this team is legitimate and that they are they're serious and they want to uh, continue to offer coordination uh, without blacklists, but they also are realistic and understand that Wasabi has serious fundamental issues in the mixing that that happens on the blockchain, the transactions that are occurring on the blockchain. So hopefully that they'll um, take that seriously and make fixes that to date the Wasabi development team has refused to make. Um, now, the second part of your question is, I, I, I saw that as well. Um, I believe it was the Wasabi community manager who suggested that maybe, you know, you could run a coordinator on your umbrella. Um, you know, it, it, that that makes really no sense. Um, a coordinator needs to be uh, like well, like I just said, needs to have a diverse liquidity set. Uh, if you're the only person running the coordinator and you're the only person in the coordinator, that means you're the only person to mix with. Uh, it, so it really makes zero sense uh, at all. Um, and you don't want you know 15, 20 coordinators because then all you're doing is breaking up the liquidity. Um, that could be um, in, ag in aggregate used for a greater anonymity set. And especially with Wasabi's systemic flaws, uh, less liquidity um, s makes the flaws really, really easy to notice and very, very apparent. Uh, so, you know, th they have a uphill journey ahead of them, this team, but I do wish them success and I wish them luck in offering coordination services uh, that do not engage in, in UTXO censorship like the default coordinator is going to do. Hi, Samurai Wallet. Um, could you expand on um, some of the details in the uh, Financial Times article, uh, in particular around sort of the numbers they're using, or I guess ill-informed numbers perhaps they're using um, as basis of the article. Uh, in particular, they've said, you know, around 15% of all proceeds of crime was rooted through mixes in 2021, according to Elliptic. And then it goes on to say in the following sentence, you know, well-known services include Wasabi Wallet, Samurai Wallet and Helix. And then, yeah. you know, so they're, they're, they're not only sort of <laughs> using numbers that are perhaps inflated already, uh, you know, that 15% number, but then also merging sort of non-custodial and con custodial, um, you know, <laughs> coin join and mixes together, if you like. Could you expand mm -hmm. on that? Yeah, that's a really good point, uh, Rabbit. Um, so let me start with the Helix connection there, because it's actually, that's, that's kind of funny that this was added in. And it really kind of shows what this is about. So Helix, if you're unaware, was a custodial Bitcoin mixer, uh, meaning you sent your Bitcoin to this entity, the operator of Helix, and you hoped that he would send you back unconnected Bitcoin. So it was, you know, it was a, a, a trust laden operation, right? And you know he um, he he advertised the uh, the site. Um, on, on message boards and, and hidden services and wherever else and explicitly advertised as a way to launder money. Uh, the exact term was used. Um, the reason I find it funny is because, and not funny for this individual, but funny that it, or ironic that it was in the article, is, um, is because the Helix operator was arrested and he was put into prison and charged with money laundering. Um, so that was a successful operation where, you know, it wasn't the National Crime Agency, I don't believe. They may have been a partner, um, but it, I believe it was U.S. forces where they took down a quote-unquote money launderer uh, using existing uh, laws and existing regulations against the uh, money transmission. And that's really what it comes down to is transmission of money, transmission of funds. If you're taking custody of anyone's private keys or anyone's funds, you become uh, a custodian, you become a transmitter. And, and that is a regulated activity in most countries in the world. 
So the fact that they they commingled Helix, which is a custodial uh, mixing service, with with Usabi and Samurai, which are non-custodial, um, you know, displays exactly what the goal, uh, you know, of the NCA is, which is more people are moving on to non-custodial solutions. We don't have the legislative or regulatory ammo to do anything about it and we want to change that we want the power now so they're priming you know they're priming the the barrel and and the reaction of wasabi if this is indeed the reaction to this is is playing right into the hands of this regulator or or, or this agency it's playing right into their hands because they admit right they admit they have nothing they can't do anything about it existed using existing law and regulation so if they wanted something to do something about it they would have to propose new law or new regulation right and the the funny thing is in order really to uh, quote unquote effectively stop that in a non-custodial coin join scenario is you would have to make it an illegal act you would have to make the person doing it uh you know, subject to a crime because they're the ones that are doing it. It's not the third, it's not Samurai and it's not Wasabi, it's them. Uh, you know, so um, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. And the, the fact that it was put in there. Uh, so the, the other part of the question was about elliptic and really what is being used by the NCA as the, the gotcha, the big gotcha, we have to do it because of this is uh, a 15% figure, I believe is what it is, of um, illicit transactions into, you know, into uh, mixers. Yeah, 15% of all proceeds of crime <laughs> was routed through mixers in 2021, according to Elliptic, uh, a group that analyzes cryptocurrency transactions, right? So let's not forget, of course, Elliptic is a for-profit company that relies on government contracts. Right. So what they they essentially did was put together a brochure uh, for the National Crime Agency to say, hey, this is why you need to hire us, because this look at all of this crime that's happening. And they don't provide the underlying data and they don't provide anything other than a headline figure of 15 percent. Right. Well, the funny thing is that FinCEN in the United States, which is not a for-profit company, it's a regulator or, or guidance um, a, agency, uh, did their own analysis in 2020, and you found that the largest uh, flows of illicit funds in the Bitcoin come from ransomware, which uh, account for 1%. Um, so the 1% and 15% numbers are so drastically different that, you know, one of them is obviously wrong. <laughs> Which one is it? Um, so we, you know, we don't look at anything that Elliptic or Chainalysis or any of those guys put out as anything other than brochures and commercials for themselves because they don't provide any data to back it up. But that is what's being used, you know, as the justification. And these are the people, exactly these people who Wasabi are going to partner with to enforce the blacklisting. And that's what's so messed up. Hello, friends. Do you hear me? Can I ask a quick question? Please do. So, I'm DK, by the way. I have orange built quite a few people through the last five years, and I've always told everyone that Bitcoin is decentralized, has no jurisdiction, censorship resistant, and I've also told them it can be private, convinced a lot of people to use Samra and white matters. And yesterday, when the news broke out, a few people messaged me <laughs> at the same time. It was quite funny because I learned from friends that this is happening with Wasabi and everyone asked me why why does Wasabi and why do we care at all if if Bitcoin has no 
jurisdiction. We're not saying, and that sounds a bit childish, but I'm just following the question because I couldn't answer it myself. If it doesn't matter if Bitcoin censorship resistant, why do we care? Why Wasabi can just say, suck my sats, like just make a joke of it and be above all of this? Why do they have so, to comply with anything if they have privacy? Why can't everything just be run over Tor, have a forum there, have a website, hide their identities and all that stuff? Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, when, when Wasabi was created, they made a decision to, you know, um, associate their identities with the project. They made a decision to register the project in uh, the EU, an EU jurisdiction. They made a decision to build out, you know, offices and hire a lot of people um, on payroll and salary. And when you make these decisions, you know, you, your maneuverability uh, reduces significantly. So, yes, while Bitcoin itself is uh, by you know, at the protocol uh, level, quote unquote, censorship resistant, if you put... You, if you've made yourself a, a big target and and put all these hooks into the the fiat system or the you know the real world system, then you're gonna have to you know you're gonna have to, to react and, and and do things right. So I, again, there's no justification for what they've done in terms of how they've reacted. Um, but as a as a company and as a regulated or not a regulated, but as a uh, a registered company, you know, they would have to do something if a regulation came down the line to say, you know, you can't do what you're doing. And and that's why I said in the earlier, a little earlier that, you know, uh, jurisdiction hopping, re regulatory arbitrage is is a viable option for, for entities like Wasabi to, to engage in. Um, you know, even, even us who, Samurai, which is very non-traditional we have no we're not in any one jurisdiction uh, any servers that we have are in a very privacy preserving and privacy friendly um country um you know the, the there are no real employees everyone is a contributor doing it out of passion uh there's no office there's nothing like that so our maneuverability is greater when we need to move jurisdictions for instance it's a lot easier and cheaper for us to do that um, so in, in, in a sense, I, I understand what you're saying. And, you know, I, I think that to a degree you're, you're right. The response from Wasabi shouldn't have been, um, you know, blacklist and compliance. Uh, it should have been, here's why you're wrong. And we're willing to fight you on this and put money in the form of lawyers and, and legal challenges and, and whatever we have to do, because that's why we set up a company. Right. So, you know, we're run by two lawyers. Like, why wasn't there a challenge? You know, uh, why wasn't there anything, anything like this? Um, but but yeah, you know, Bitcoin is censorship resistant. But the, if the platforms and services on top aren't, then really, what do you what do you have? And we've we've all now accepted that third parties and um, KYC and AML and regulated entities you don't get censorship resistance from them, right? They, they're not gonna help you out in that respect. But it's, it's been assumed that non-custodial um, software, <laughs> you, you did still have that, that censorship resistance uh, because that's the whole point of Bitcoin. But the, and that's why I think everyone is so, there's such a big noise about this is because that trust or that, that belief has been shattered with a non-custodial wallet um, going down this route. Thank you for your answer. And it hurts. It, it upsets me because normie friends that have been trying so hard to orange pill with ideas of freedom are showing me articles that one of the only two big players in the private Bitcoin space, like the companies advertising privacy and fighting for it, they don't have employees that they can just pay in clean Bitcoin and be without the jurisdiction, follow the, the ideals of this whole Bitcoin movement that we can make a new alternative world in the Internet and have freedom there.
Why? Yeah, I What's absolutely agree. It's so shocking that a privacy company chose to go that route and all the normies are seeing that they've heard vaguely about this Bitcoin thing and now they hear the government cracking down on something and then the companies comply and it just ruins the whole reputation. It, it feels to me like I've wasted my words with these people for so long. Yeah, I, I, trust me, I, I definitely understand what you're, what you're saying. It's not even just those who have, you know, recommended Wasabi. Or it's, it's all of us in the privacy space. It's, it's, um, it's a shocking thing to see. Um, and uh, I, I think, I, as we kind of mentioned earlier on the talk, that it makes it, it, makes it harder um, for the rest of us because it can be used as a case study of, of how compliance can be implemented in, in you know, the non-custodial sector of Bitcoin, you know, and uh, it, it seeds ground needlessly. It shifts the the playing field, uh, the battlefield to their decision, their choice, right? Like you, when you're organizing a battle, you want to be the one that sets the terrain. You don't want the opponent to set the terrain, um, and that's exactly what they've done: is allow the, the opponent to set the terrain. I would have I would have liked to uh, see a. If there is indeed, and I don't believe there is, but if there is indeed a legal challenge or a regulatory challenge, I would have liked to see um, a robust defense against it. And that, you know, that includes firing up the lawyers um, and, and filing and you know, making court filings and making objections and doing all that stuff uh, that, you know, lawyers do. But you're a successful uh, coin join coordinator um you should you should be willing to invest some of your profits into a robust legal defense for your industry that you benefit from and um it's certainly what we would do you know we're, we we don't have as big of a budget as wasabi does we don't have um as many investors and we don't have all the same resources at our disposal but what we do have um is a spirit to fight and a legal team that we keep on retainer to look into these, you know, these regulatory changes, for example, for one, but also to be ready to respond immediately to any encroachment. Um, it's such a weird, it's such a weird kind of shift in, in thinking that just because you get a request from a government, that means you have to comply immediately. Like, that's not how it works. You get a, it's called a request, right? They want you to comply or it's a court order. There's two different things, right? And in both of the, one is a request and one's an order. And in both of those situations, that's what lawyers are for because they respond to those things and they know how to respond to it in a way that doesn't expose you, but keeps your, your goals in mind, right? Uh, and I would have liked to see a robust defense if there, uh, and then I, I think the reason why we didn't see that is because there is no regulation that that's forcing them to do this. I don't believe it. I haven't seen it. No one has been able to tell me what regulation it is. All that we've heard is that there's some some regulation out there that Wasabi has been non-compliant with to, uh, up until this point and suddenly has to become compliant with. Uh, and until someone shows me what that regulation is, um, this was this response is due to a a financial times article by a reporter based on the desires of um of an agency in the united kingdom like it's just it's just too crazy to to think about there's just something yeah sorry I, I was just gonna say this might be a good opportunity on your guys end to like really instill some hope in this community because it's like I, I totally hear what this guy's saying right it's like you, you put so much time and effort into it and now it's like a big player like a wasabi decides to do this i think that there's a lot of people that say or, you know you're feeling the ripples in the bitcoin community saying well man is there even any point um anymore to be able to do some of this stuff and then normies see it and go well see it's just the same as fiat um yeah. so i guess a, a question for for you is like from like buying Bitcoin or obtaining Bitcoin to end product, mixed, spendable, clean Bitcoin, 
what what's a good way that's still viable to have clean coin? Could you explain that? Like you, you plug your own product, you know, and everything like that. I, I'd love to hear, you know, how you guys would recommend just being, you know, clean UTXOs Bitcoin. Yeah, sure. I mean, the the only thing we would recommend is Whirlpool. Like, you know, the <laughs> that's the whole point of it. Uh, just but just to be clear, um, when you say clean UTXOs, I, I know you're speaking uh, in a you know collo- colloquial fashion, but the you bought those UTXOs on exchange, so the exchange has your KYC information. Uh, just because you enter any coin join doesn't mean that the exchange will no longer have that information. They'll still know that you obtained these uh, UTXOs, you, and at, at a certain point, you put them into a coin join, right? That's and that's where the trail will end for them. Uh, but that's that they still have a record of that, you know, purchase and and where they went um, before the coin join. Now, the point of the coin join is to disassociate future activity of those coins um, with their past so that exchange or anyone else looking can't, uh, with 100% probability, uh, you know, reliability, know that, hey, these are the same coins. Um, the only only coin join implementation to break 100% deterministic links is our implementation of coin join called Whirlpool. Uh, so whether that be you use Samurai to do that or whether you use Sparrow Wallet to do that, uh, both are using uh, an implementation of Whirlpool and both are using a single coordinator. So you're getting a, a large, diverse uh, liquidity pool. So, yeah, my I mean, my recommendation would be to set up a Samurai Wallet, set up a Sparrow Wallet, whichever one you prefer. Receive your coins into that wallet. Uh, and when you have a, a large enough balance of at least 0.001 Bitcoin to enter into a, a Whirlpool mix. And from there, you have a huge amount of tools available to you uh, for when it becomes time to spend those uh, those those mixed coins. Uh, we have post-mix tools, both, again, Samurai and Sparrow now has post-mix tools, uh, such as Stonewall X2 and Stowaway. Um, Sparrow has the ability to mix those UTXOs direct to your cold storage. Uh, so, you know, the depending on how you want to interact with your mixed coins afterwards, there's various options for you within the within the Samurai ecosystem and the, the Whirlpool, uh, sorry, the Sparrow wallet uh, ecosystem as well. And if you're coming from Wasabi, then Sparrow is a natural choice because it's a desktop wallet, you know? Um, so uh, the migration would be very easy. You put the same words in, you can connect it up to your own your own, uh, your own own node. Uh, and the the process is, uh, is pretty smooth sailing for a Wasabi user to come over. Uh, again, I don't know why Telegram isn't telling me which people are speaking. So whoever uh, just asked that, thank you. Um, and I, you know, I agree that it's a, a you know an image problem uh, broadly for CoinJoin and for Bitcoin privacy when these type of events happen. Um, you know, normies will get the you know the tabloid or the bite size uh, headline. See, oh, you know, big privacy wallet adds, you know, UTXO censorship, and then they go, yeah, what's the difference between this and fiat? And in some ways, they're absolutely right. They should be saying that. It's, it's an embarrassment uh, that, that you know, you know, this is this thing is kind of uh, morphing and turning into a glorified PayPal. You know, no one, no one here wants that. And um, these types of events and these types of decisions that these people are making move, uh, move at least the uh, perception that to, to that that way and I would argue uh, in some cases it's reality you know custodial services are are rampant uh, KYC AML is rampant you know uh, now we're seeing non-custodial wallets start to implement regulatory uh, rec- uh, suggestions like first the AOPP um, and then now the uh, wasabi implementing blacklist based uh, possibly on an article. Exactly. In, in this world of surveillance that we live in, Bitcoin's been our only 
hope of freedom and strength. And there's something about the word compliance in the context of Bitcoin that feels like fear. It feels like weakness. And it's fear. When, That's and, exactly what it is. Yeah. Remember when Elon Musk, and I don't like the guy at all, but remember when he had some issues with the SEC and he tweeted that the E in SEC stands for Elon's and people went crazy. This is the type of attitude that I expected from Wasabi and I think they owed it to their community to support their hope and belief of freedom. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, look, it's been it's been no uh, surprise that we've had our issues with Wasabi over the years. Uh, it's always focused on the fact that their mixing uh, protocol was weak and flawed. Um, and we did our best to demonstrate those flaws in a reproducible and verifiable fashion. Uh, but this is a whole this is a whole other, you know, other issue. This is is incredibly surprising that they would make a move like this. And, you know, as Stefan said earlier, um, what we need to await, you know, actual details from Wasabi. I, I can't for the life of me understand why they chose to announce this in, in the way that they did. Um, so we'll await those details, but as I've, as I've hopefully demonstrated when we were looking at the, the um, fifth money laundering directive, which is what they would be regulated under if, uh, if any of the regulations, um, there's nothing there. That's not, there, there's absolutely zero there that would require them to do anything like this. And there's no, there's nothing, there's no law ever uh, anywhere that says you can't discuss what regulations that you comply with. You know, that's, that's absurd. So I, I think that the regulation needs to be um, disclosed to their users and to the wider community. And so we and, and everyone involved can start to look at that regulation and figure out how do we fight it, whether it be undermining the regulation tech, uh, through technical means, so making changes to services, architecture changes, that would render the uh, the regulation as not applicable to the application anymore, uh, or or more um, traditional means, like I said, as um, uh, legal fights. But until until someone shows us the damn regulation, it's all just uh, it's all fluff. You know, you you complied, you know, without any requirement or need to. And, and one of the things that um, we've said in our community for a long time is asking permission is seeking denial and and that's exactly what they've done they're, they're starting to ask permission and it's absurd they just dropped out of the privacy conversation and, and this is sad even though their product is lesser i think that it's always been very helpful for all the bitcoiners for the whole community that there are two players in the privacy space and all the drama between samurai and wasabi all the memes all the arguments on twitter it drew more attention to privacy involved more people helped them in depth understand the, the nuances of the privacy i myself was a wasabi customer at the beginning i was a tester of the first uh hold wallet or something it, and yeah. After that, I learned about Samurai, and the reason why I learned the true privacy, the differences, and the, it was comparing the two projects. And now if we don't have two projects in the space anymore, I, I see this as a damage to the overall idea of privacy. Yeah, well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, uh, there's still obviously joint market, and that's an active project, and it's actively developed. Um, you know, in terms of mixed quality, it's not as good as, as a uh, whirlpool, um, but it's absolutely better than wasabi. Uh, so, you know, there, there's still that. And I, I think that, at least speaking just for Samurai, you know, we, um, I won't say that the competition between Samurai and wasabi has made us better because the, the competition against, in terms of when you're looking at the mixes is there is none. The mixes are terrible on Wasabi. Um, there, you know, we could have done 
fifty percent as good of a job as we did with Whirlpool in terms of mixed composition, and it would have been a vast, vastly better thing than wasabi. Um, so for us, I would I would actually say we would we would like to see a competent competitor uh, because then you know there could actually be more pressure to outcompete, and and when when there's that type of pressure there, the consumer usually is the winner. Uh, they get the the best products possible. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to see a competent competitor if there's going to be one, and maybe this this team that forked Wasabi will become that competent competitor. I, I doubt it, but I wish them luck and hope that they do become that. Um, you know, but but ultimately, fact of the matter is Bitcoin privacy. Um, there are tools that let you achieve high levels of Bitcoin privacy today. We brought these tools to market. Other wallets have implemented these tools. Uh, so the situation for Bitcoin users uh, of trying to attain Bitcoin privacy is, is vastly better than it was just a few years ago. So things have improved tremendously. Um, so, you know, I, I'm definitely bullish still uh, for our own stuff, uh, particularly. Um, this is a setback, but it's a social setback. Uh, it, it's yet again um, Wasabi tainting the, the the name of Bitcoin privacy. Yet again, doing uh, you know substandard operations. At this time, it's not on blue blockchain. It's it's on a, at a social level. Well, is there any other uh, questions from anyone? We've gone about, I think, an hour, a little over an hour. So if there's no other questions, we'll wrap this up. Um, just just jump in if there is. I'm going to check the chat to see if there's anything text-wise coming. I want to see somebody get a Wasabi blacklist to do TXO, send it through Whirlpool, and, and send it through Wasabi. Chef's kiss. Uh, yeah, Jocko, that's funny. Uh, it's 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 actually funny. Um, when I, I think it was in the beta phase still of Wasabi Wallet when they when they first launched, um, someone had sent Bitcoin to the Wasabi Wallet from their Samurai Wallet, and by default, Samurai will send the transaction as a stone wall. Uh, and what a Stonewall is, um, is a fake coin join, uh, or a Stonewall X2 is a real uh, coin join, but it's, it's miniature in size. And they, they sent the coin to their Wasabi wallet, and the Wasabi wallet registered it as a mixed output with a, with a high privacy score. And they weren't able to mix it, and they asked, you know, Noparo, you know, why? Um, and he said, and he, he actually said, you know, I guess the, the Stonewall alg algorithm fooled the wasabi wallet so i suspect that whatever blacklist that they actually end up implementing uh you could get you could get around it pretty easily um either by yeah whirlpooling uh setting a post mix utxo but probably even just ricochet would work uh it ricochet works great for like uh, exchanges like coinbase and you know all the all the centralized exchanges getting around those stupid blacklists so i can't imagine why ricochet wouldn't work uh perfectly for getting around the Wasabi blacklist. Uh, but why would you? Like, why would you at that point enter in? Um, let's see. Any Anything else here? Uh, Crypto NT says, I think they damage their reputation beyond repair. Uh, but you guys see any future benefit to uh, steganographic joins for general purpose spends? Yeah, absolutely. A stowaway is a steganographic uh, coin join. Uh, so that's the first one that we put in, and, and it's really cool. I think I think the the concept is very cool, and the more uh, implementations of of those types of um, transactions increases the efficiency or the the effectiveness of those types of uh, transactions because those types of transactions are all about uh, undermining <clears throat> undermining heuristics uh, because. You can't you can't uh, reliably believe what you see on the blockchain when it comes to these transactions in terms of what you would normally expect, uh, and therefore all transactions that look like these 
have to be looked at suspiciously or with, um, you know, they have a higher chance of being steganographic. Uh, so, you know, you want kind of like a mass uh, usage there. Uh, so we think that there's, there's problems there, but uh, not as any kind of replacement for a, a proper uh, zero link coin join. Uh, Samurai, I have a quick question. Um, okay. Paynums, how, how difficult are they to implement into existing wallets? And the reason I'm asking is because, as as you as you stated, Sparrow has has implemented it. You guys have always had paynums, but I see it as uh, I don't see other wallets even speaking about how they're trying to do it or, or when they they think they they start implementing um, privacy features such as this. Is it a very difficult thing to, to implement, or is it just that they're not looking at it as as something that um, takes precedence right now? I think it's more of the latter. I think that it's not something that takes precedence for them. Um, I don't think it's necessarily difficult to implement. Um, the The problem had been primarily that there wasn't really any um, library support for a long time, right? So it was it was a little bit more difficult to implement because unless you were implementing it in Java, which is how we implemented it in our Android app, of course, uh, you would have to write write quite a bit of code from scratch. You would have to do uh, a lot of kind of crypto um, point math and, and stuff like that, curve math. Uh, but these days, there's a JavaScript library. I believe there's a Rust library. There's obviously the Java implementation, the Java library. So implement, uh, you know, implementing it into an existing wallet, I wouldn't say is hard these days. It's, it's relatively straightforward. Um, I think a lot of people or developers still defer too much to gatekeepers. And uh, when Bit47, Paynims, as we call it, when they were introduced, um, the core developers of the time did not like the proposal. They thought that it was uh, spammy. Uh, they had other uh, misunderstandings, frankly, about it. And they recommended that wallet developers don't implement it. Um, but again, a recommendation is just that, a recommendation. We, we looked at the, the proposal, we looked at the spec, and we saw the, the, the huge, huge privacy potential in such a tool and, and uh, implemented it. And hopefully, well, you can see with Sparrow that they have been the, the second wallet to implement it. Uh, and I think that's really one of the strong suits of Craig over at Sparrow is he, he looks at the, the facts objectively. He looks at the, the problem statement and then the, the solution. And if things line up and things make sense, he'll implement it. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't ask permission and he doesn't seek approval. Um, and, and I think that's, that's really what it is. That's what it takes. Uh, if you, if you're building your Bitcoin wallet and you have like, you know, a big product team and a product guy and they're doing all these, you know, fucking product things and surveys and talking to these people and they don't have a real understanding, um, of what it is people need. Uh, and if privacy is not at their forefront, they'll never think of the things they'll never think of. So that's I, that's why I don't think it's it's taken off uh, in the mainstream wallets. But we're gonna I think we're gonna see a lot more wallets soon implementing uh, BIP forty seven. Yeah, because I, I, I for one have seen when when uh, everything was going down in Canada um, with um, that I can't remember the, the, the platform's name, but Telecoin came out and they had implemented paynums. Um, for a way to receive your donation, so instead of just only being a, a, a non-custodial way of getting to it, you could you, you could do paynums directly, uh, um, and have people that paynums donate to your paynum through your Telecoin page. So that's why I thought if, if they can do it, is it still such a difficult thing to implement, or is it just that? So thanks again for the answer. Yeah, uh, specifically on Tallycoin, for for them, implementation was incredibly easy. All they all they have to do is um, allow users to provide a payment code, uh, and they display it onto their screen, and they can get the you know the bot image and the the name or whatever. They can get that from the payment code uh, payment payment.is website, but none of that's required. All they need is that 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 string of text. Um, so for for services to implement uh, in that way is very, very easy. Um, 
it's a little, like I said, a little bit more difficult if you're a wallet developer implementing to your wallet. But these days, it's relatively easy because so many libraries now exist for Bit47. Yeah, understood. Understood. All right. There's been a lot of chatter in the in the chat. I'm just going through it real quick. Um, and then we'll wrap can this up. Add, uh, oh, go ahead, add, Michael. You can talk about the Samurai Wallet Roadmap. Samurai Wallet Roadmap. Uh, well, we have, we, we've been working on some stuff. I, I, I've teased it a couple of times in various podcasts. Uh, we've been working on something real hard for the last a uh, little more than a year. Uh, we're hoping to have something to announce uh, Guns and Bitcoin uh, in April. So stay tuned for that. Uh, other than that, we're looking, uh, we're always looking at uh, increasing the, um, increasing the, or improving uh, anything that we can in the wallet in terms of uh, enhancing privacy for users. So one thing that we've been looking at is multi-party TX zeros, which, um, so if you don't know about Whirlpool, when you enter Whirlpool, you make a transaction called a TX zero. That's like the entrance transaction uh, before, before mixing starts. Uh, so right now it's safe to assume that one, uh, that all the inputs in a TX zero belong to one entity that is entering Whirlpool with a multi-party TX zero. You wouldn't be able to assume that anymore because one TX zero could, uh, contain inputs from many different people entering into Whirlpool. Uh, that's one of the ones I'm, I'm most excited about. Um, and, we want to um, bring the mix to XPUB feature that's currently only in our command line uh, tool uh, and also available on Sparrow. We want to bring that into the mobile wallet itself as well. So users will be able to mix to their cold storage after a certain number or threshold is met. Um, various improvements like that, I think, are on the, the, the short term roadmap. Uh, but the long term roadmap is still a secret for, for the time being, guys. Seems really promising. I, I I will be a fan of, of the cold storage part and the multi-party piece of this world. I mean, makes makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I just have to, one quick question regarding the, sure. the uh, regarding the number of pools that you offer. Maybe it would make sense now to to increase the number from zero point zero five to zero point five. Yeah, there is. I, I feel there is a quick really a high gap between one amount and the other, and maybe with, uh, you know, samurai work disappearing or at least being useless, there is a lot of people looking for, for alternatives, and th there would be an opportunity for you to, to, to increase that, that pool there. So I think what you're saying is um, a pool denomination um, that's less yeah, than exactly. 0. 0.5, yeah, less than 0. 0.5, but more than 0. 0.05, is that right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's an argument to it. Uh, the, the, the issue is we have to be cautious about adding new pools because one, uh, it's one, it's very difficult to remove a pool. I don't even know if it's possible. I mean, it's, it's theoretically possible. Um, but, but what does that mean for remixing and all that sort of stuff? Um, so we need to be very, very conservative and careful about creating pools. Um, cause one, we don't want to, take away liquidity from uh, one pool just to have it move over to the other pool and then the remixers and whatnot uh, suffer in the in the other, you know, the lower pool that lost its liquidity. So we want to make sure there's a true uh, demand there and that new liquidity is coming in to, to hit that demand. So uh, what I will say is that we study the liquidity and the pool activity very closely. Um, and we are, we are looking at the kind of average uh, TX0 deposit size that comes in, the average pool choice, and hopefully we'll be able to make um, informed decisions about uh, the liquidity pools. Uh, one of the good things about Whirlpool is that it's really easy, technically, to create a pool. We can create a pool in five minutes. Um, we just need to make, uh, absolute, make absolute sure um, that it's not going to cannibalize another pool and that it's going to get used. Uh, so we're, we're cautious on it, but I understand what you're saying. 
Yeah, probably the 0.5 pool would so suffer for sure. Yeah. Right, and yeah. and the point five pool already is is slower than we would like. You know, it's not like the yeah. zero point zero five pool. It's not like the zero point yeah. zero one pool, right? So, any any new pool, you would, what we would want to see is the zero point five pool, um, kind of averaging at a a remixable liquidity of a hundred UTXOs registered at any given time. Like right now, the zero point zero one and the zero one have like three hundred. The 0 0.05 has something like 200, and the 0 0.5 has something like 50 or 60 at any given time. So we'd like to yeah. see those numbers raise uh, first. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Well, all right, guys. Uh, I think that was a good chat. Thank you for, for coming and hanging with us. Uh, I'm going to um, – I've recorded this. I'm going to be putting it on YouTube. Uh, if any of you that spoke have an issue with being put on YouTube, just send me a direct message and I'll try to edit you out. Um, all right. Thanks for, thanks for joining up. And if there's anything else, speak now or forever hold your peace. All right. Take it easy. Have a good one.